This heritage feature starts with a recording of a visit I made to Southfields Farm, home of Jane and Mark Barnes in Somerby, Leicestershire. They are dairy farmers and have Ayrshire cows whose milk is used to produce the world-famous Stilton cheese. The farm is in the countryside stewardship and entry-level stewardship schemes, which means they work to encourage wildlife, habitat and ecology on the farm. Jane often gives talks or runs school visits to share stories about life on the farm and has her very own blog where she writes about day-to-day -day life of farmer's wife and she shares her recipes, including one for the tea bread I was treated to. You can find this at wwwfarmerbarns 898blogspotcouk In the meantime, let's go over to Jane. Welcome to Southfields Farm. Uh, this is a family-run dairy farm. I've been in the Barnes family for three generations. My husband's a third generation. Uh, we've children, uh, Charlotte, who's 19, and Harry, who's 16. So the next generation are coming along nicely. We specialise in producing milk for Stilton cheese production. We sell three-quarters of a million litres per year to Long Clawson Dairies, which is about 12 miles from here, north of Melton. And they make a lot of cheeses, actually, not just Blue Stilton, but that's, the, that's their core product. And it's a quite a, well, it's a very big company now and uh, one of the major producers of Stilton. Milk for Stilton has to come from the three counties of Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. So the cows have to be grazing in those three counties to produce what is called Stilton cheese. So anything else uh, beyond that, you, you hear of it, Shropshire Blues and, and other blue cheeses uh, are obviously made in other parts. Because of that, we decided five years ago to go from Frisian herd to an Ayrshire herd. And now we've got a pedigree Ayrshire herd that we've been buying in Ayrshire heifers for the last five years. And they were in calf to Ayrshire, so any of the female calves, they're called heifers, we keep and rear. And then in two years' time, they become cows and start producing milk. So we are in that process uh, now in year six. With about 90% of our herd is Ayrshire, we've still got a number of black and white Frisians that are still in perfectly working order, so they are producing calves and producing milk, and it all goes in the same tank. The milk we've used for your coffee this morning is all fresh milk from this morning's milking. At the moment we're in height of capacity, we're producing a lot of milk from our cows, and this has turned out to be a very good grazing year. Lots and lots of grass, as you know from your lawns at home. It's been an absolutely brilliant grass-growing year and the cows are grazing. We've got plenty of fodder out there in the field, so they're grazing fresh pasture every two or three days. That's helping to keep the milk yield up. And this year we decided to start calving in the middle of March and we've calved probably 80% of the herd to now, to the end of August. Uh, we've got a, we had one born last night. It turned out to be a Hereford. We did have a Hereford bull um, a year ago, so we've got a few Herefords popping out. But from now on, we're only breeding Ayrshire because we've got two Ayrshire bulls. So it all started nine months ago, really. The cows have to visit the bull to get pregnant. Nine months later, they give birth. The cow only gives milk because she's had a baby. So each cow on our farm has to have a calf every year. And what we're trying to do is keep the calving block between... Um, predominantly March and July with a few tail enders through the rest of the summer and then we've got a few calving in September, October time for the winter milk. So we're producing in the region of well over 2,500 litres a day on this farm currently, which is very high capacity. We've never reached this target before. A cow gives the most milk she's going to give in the first 100 days of lactation and we coincided that with the grass growing is produced good quality lots of milk. And the milk you're drinking is of the constituents of butter, fat and protein. 3.3 for protein regularly. We've not dropped below that this year. And above, and then the butter fat, we aim for 4%, but at the moment it's about 3.7. So it's just dropped a bit. But we get paid on the protein content of the milk. So we're very pleased. And that's one of the reasons we've gone to Ayrshire. So we're very keen to keep them pedigree. Everything that's pedigree has got a name. It's probably handed down from its mother. So if Mary gave birth to a heifer, 
she becomes Mary 1, and then if Mary 1 grows up and gives birth to a heifer, it becomes Mary 2. But in the meantime, the original Mary's had a couple more heifers, and you just add a number to the end. So you basically get a family, sort of a family tree. So if you've got a really good cow and you, you, know, you keep getting heifers from her, then you know the family name, and that's how it works. So that's the pedigree side. My husband loves cows, loves the genetic side of cows, yeah, planning the breeding and controlling all that sort of thing. And uh, I'm the office person, really. I'm the accounts and do the VAT and, and um, look after the office side, as well as giving these talks and, and offering people to visit the farm. Uh, obviously, in spring, I have um, late spring, I have a lot of school kids come, and uh, that's always very entertaining. And the questions are brilliant. I love the questions. They saw Mark one day. He popped his head around the door. And they said, you know, what time do you get up? He says, five o'clock. He said, what time do you go to bed? He says, about you know, half eleven, twelve o'clock. He says, ooh, he says, why do you do it? That's a good question. Why do you do it? Yeah, he didn't know how to answer that one. Why does he do it? Because he can't do anything else. So um, if you're refreshed, we'll go for a walk. What we're going to do is we're going to walk up the fields. The cows are across the road today. They're on some new fresh pasture that is dying for them to eat it because I walk the fields now every Friday me and BT the dog we walk and we measure the grass growth every Friday this season first time I've done it it's a New Zealand system and so we know which fields are producing well the best grass so we try and put the cows on so they graze it right back down again and then leave the paddock for a week or so, a week to ten days. Well, this year it's been only a week or ten days and then it's refreshed and grown again. And luckily we've got 300 acres here, so we've got plenty of pasture for 120 cows we've got in the milking herd at the moment. I just wanted to know what you did with the calves that weren't heifers. Well, they'll be the bull calves or the beef calves, because, as I say, we had a beef bull a year ago, so we are getting the odd beef calf They'll go to market at about four to six weeks old. I'll rear them with the others on milk twice a day, and then we introduce corn and hay. Um, and then I've got three that will go to Melton Market next Tuesday. So we're very lucky we've still got a market on our doorstep. How many years do you keep a cow for calving? How, how long? The maiden heifer is a, is a young female that hasn't had a baby, OK? So they're two years old uh, when they start calving. Um, so we've, we were trying this morning to get some heifers out to put with the bull uh, unsuccessfully, but they're, they're rising 15 months old now, so that's when you run them with the bull. And we want the cow to get back in calf every year, every year, every year, and the fertility average on our farm is probably about eight calves. So the cow will be 10 years old because it's two That's years old. Time, so, you know, they don't owe us anything when they get to that stage. And some of the uh, Frisians on the farm, they're sort of 12, 13 years old. So they are coming to the end of their life. And you do get problems like the quality of the milk isn't so good. And they have something called somatic cell count. And we've got a cow this morning that's produced the wrong sort of milk. And I've had a sample come on the internet, which I read on my phone. So it's all very technical now. So they, every bull tank collected, which we're collected every two days on this farm, to go to Long Clawson. And then the sample of milk from the bull tank is tested, and then periodically through the month. So not every day, but periodically. They send us a readout, and we can adjust what's going on. And we also milk record to find out which cow is producing the wrong sort of milk that has this cell count in it, high cell count. So we suspect it's the Frisians, because they're older cows, and um, we milk recorded last Thursday... So I take a sample of milk from each cow once a month. The cow gives birth and then she comes on cycle on heat every three weeks and she's on heat for about 24 hours. And so in the first three months of after giving birth, not only are they giving the most milk they're going to give, the first 100 days, but they've also got to be fertile to get pregnant again. So a cow is a very multitasking animal. So not only is she producing five, 6,000 litres of milk per year in that 10-month lactation, she's also carrying the next calf. So her yeah, body's yeah, working so really hard. Okay. And at the moment, all the uh, nutrients they're getting is mostly from grass. It's brilliant. So these in this field, there's five here, and these were born in October, November, and then we didn't have any calf in December, January, February. So we now want to keep that because the problem about December, January, February is the weather, the sheds, everything's inside, and we struggle for space. And also it's a hell of a lot more work. Um, you know, we have to bed them as well as feed them. 
and scrape out and clean them and bed the cubicles. We'll go back that way and I'll show you what we do in the winter. And we built a new milking parlour. We'll talk about that when we get there. The, the winter time, the milk yield will be a lot less. That's a heap of, we're covered in black plastic and tyres, road tyres, to weigh down the black plastic. And that's our winter feed, that's silage. And that's a brand new clamp we built this spring to put it all in. So all our fodder for this winter is in one place. It's all in that clamp. And that's got to feed everything. It's got to feed the calves as well as the cows. Uh, in the past, where you've parked your cars was the old silage clamp. And that was built for 60 cows. We've now 120 cows plus oh, young right, stock. Yeah. And last year, that, that we ran out in January. That just wasn't enough silage. Yeah. The biggest thing dairy farmers are doing now is looking at costs. We know how much we're getting paid for our milk and we have to reduce our costs. So we've reduced our water bill by drilling our own borehole. We have free water in all the water troughs. Cows drink a lot of water. Milk is 80% water. In the summer, when they're all out in the fields, all that is now free water and that's saved us 8,000 a year. Um, on the other side of this shed, last year we put up 44 solar panels to help with electricity cost because we need electricity every day, twice a day, to run the milking parlour. So that doesn't run the milking parlour, that goes into the grid, and then we buy the electricity from the grid as normal, because obviously in the winter there's no sunshine at 5 o'clock in the morning. So we can't rely on that solely to fund the farm, so it's a cash flow thing. And then we're looking at a wind turbine as our next thing. And also cutting costs, all sorts of little costs like buying our dairy chemicals in bulk, six months at a time. We're now buying it in 200 gallons so that we can cut costs. Consumables on the farm, like cow cake, which we feed the cows in the parlour, we buy that as a part of a buying group with other 20 or 30 other farmers to get the right price. So the whole system now is mainly geared to cutting costs. They, the other way of making a profit is cutting you down your costs, and that's why it's family labour as well. So my 16-year-old son has worked very hard in the summer for like five pounds a day. <laughs> that's all I can afford to pay him. <laughs> In the dairy industry, um, the dairy dictates the price to us. And most manufacturing businesses, you work yeah. out your cost, you add a bit of a margin, and you try and yeah. sell it for that yeah. product, for that price. But in the dairy industry, you've got three parts. You've got the farmer, you've got the processor, and then you've got the retailer. And the pressure comes, presumably, from the retailer saying, like Mr. Tesco's, I'm only going to pay you X amount for this milk. Okay, and the, and the dairy that's processing that milk will say, right, Mr. Farmer, I'm only getting paid this much. I've got to make a margin. I've got to make a profit. I'm only going to pay for this much. And that's what's been going on for years. The whole country is short of milk. has been for a while, but it's slowly creeping up. Um, and our dairy has a seasonality payment scheme, which means when we produce milk in April, May and June, dairy doesn't want milk in April, May and June, so they knock the price back to about 24p a litre. The milk we're producing now will be in the Stilton you eat this Christmas. That's why they want milk now, so they're now paying us about 34-35p a litre. I want to be a shot window for the dairy industry. I want people to experience what it's like on today's dairy farm in, in 2013. Lots of people come to me when I give talks and saying, I remember going on Granny's farm and helping milk the cows by hand. You know, those days, thank God, have gone. You know, the modern day is this way. And I want, us, I want to educate people because there's only 10,500 dairy farmers left in the UK. Well, England and Wales, to be precise. There's a few more in Scotland. There's about 2,000 in Scotland. But, you know, when I was born in the 1960s, that was 76,000 dairy farmers. So we've lost 65,000 dairy farmers, not cows, the dairy farmer. And the main reason, when the Farmers Weekly did a survey, the main reason was succession. Nobody in the family wanted to work as hard as Dad did. Nobody else wanted to milk the cows twice a day, every day. So I think that for the future of our farm, we've got to mechanise, modernise. My son's really into computers and into, you know, the modern way of life. And if that means milking the, the cows eventually by um, robot, so be it. There's other farmer's sons, older than my son, but there's other farmer's sons at the moment saying, Dad, I love cows, I love farming, but I don't want to be in the parlour twice a day. And I know they're putting in... Um, They've got about 150 cows and they've put in a robot for this winter. And I'm, I'm really keen to follow this lad's life. He's about 22, this lad, and I'm really keen to follow his life. Um, I, know, I know his family from years ago as well, so I've already, I know they passed, so it's interesting what this 22-year-old's going to do on this farm. What happens to the milk that doesn't quite reach the protein levels, Jane? It all goes. It all goes to the dairy and the dairy process everything. It's all to do with money. 
They'll pay you more money if you reach the certain targets they want. So basically, they'll have all the milk, they won't turn anything away, but you just don't get paid. And you can hear in the background, my father-in-law's out, he's 82. My husband's on the tractor, I think. It might be Harry, and my son's 16. Does he get an age allowance? Everybody's on five pounds a day. <laughs> Everybody, doesn't matter about your ages. Oh, the dog's got in the tractor as well, look. So Harry's on the quad bike. There's a hen, look, looking lay an egg in a movable bale that keeps moving. If there's been such a dramatic reduction in dairy farmers, where does the milk come in from? At the moment, the liquid milk market is mainly British milk, but the biggest change has been the products. Butter, cheese, cream, yoghurt... 50% of dairy products are now imported. Activia Yogurts, that's a Danish company. Anchor, I think some Anchor products are British, but it's very difficult to work out. But, you know, let's just round it up that it's New Zealand stuff. Okay, New Zealand's been in the news uh, yesterday, Frontera. Major, major dairy producing in this country, uh, in this world, in this globe. However, their major market is China. Got this problem for baby milk. Something's contaminated it. And a quarter of their industry relies on this export to China. A quarter! And they're a major milk producing country and they don't have enough domestic market for all the cows they produce. So they overproduce from their domestic needs because there's only a couple of million people live in New Zealand. Whereas in Britain, we're 63 million, aren't we? And we're growing and there's not enough milk to supply demand in this country. Yet the price isn't going up. The government doesn't want food inflation. No government doesn't matter what party is in power. No government wants food inflation. They want everyone to be able to afford food. They don't want a starving nation, do they? So they're not going to put price of food up. This is why it's going to be a battle of the fittest to survive in the dairy industry in this country now. And this is why we're talking about costs. So nowadays, not only do we talk about producing a quality milk, we do on our farm, because we're lucky that we're in Leicestershire and we're lucky that we can sell for the Stilton Cheese a premium product. Okay, we might not get the best price for our milk, but we are in this situation. It's where we are now. Okay, where else can we sell our milk is is slightly limiting because direct suppliers, they only buy milk down the M6, M5 corridor. So if you're in Cheshire, Lancashire, uh, Worcestershire, Gloucestershire, you know, Somerset, down there, if those counties down there, either side of those motorways, they'll collect your milk. But we're too far from the M1. Right. They won't come and collect our Something milk. Something never occurs to you, you know, that they will only deal where it's simple for them to get to, yeah. basically. Opening your eyes, aren't I? Yes. <laughs> now, this field is called Horse Close. And in the spring, in May and June time, it's absolutely covered in buttercups, which is actually a bad sign. It means it's low in nitrogen. But it's also covered in lots of seed heads. And you can see the seed heads of the grasses. And I said to the children, go and pick one. And they came back. And I said, go and pick another, a different one to the one you've got. And one girl went back and forth, back and forth, until she picked 12. So I know in this field there's more than 12 different species of grass. And I bought this chart and we looked at each of the seed heads up on this chart and looked at their names. Because as well as their Latin names, it's also got their common names like Timothy and Italian ryegrass and dog's tail and fox tail and the, the kids were just enthralled and I, they were entertained in this field <laughs> looking at grass and that's without picking out clover thistles nettles buttercups I said oh no buttercup cows don't eat buttercups you know we talked about what they do and don't eat and why they're in this field and we talked about the landscape because this is a rig and furrow field over 80 acres of our land is rig and furrow rig and furrow can you see it, it looks like a washboard mm-hmm. and um, I think it's done for drainage reasons but it was means it hasn't been touched by the plow for over 200 years because it was formed like this with an ox and a plow single so, so I would think it was to do with, with the d- drainage but also the hedges of our farm are very important because that shelter when it comes to bad weather and also makes it stock proof so our hedges are trimmed three times every five years so rotation around the farm and they that means they grow if you're a gardener that you know that it grows thicker at the bottom if you keep them short at the top now the hedge straight ahead of us there can you see is quite long and lanky there's a tree or two in there but that is one hedge that belonged to our neighbor she didn't like 
trimming hedges when she was alive um, she'd rather have a high hedge like that now the problem is it goes weak in the bottom and sheep or cattle start rubbing their backs against the branches the branches fall off and eventually it becomes gappy and the animals can walk straight through all because we didn't trim it so that's the only part on our farm that's not got a trimmed hedge and because of it we have to fence it on our side we have to put a barbed wire fence up so more work more expense they also cover the ditch and the ditch in there is like the motorway network. And the wildlife on our farm use it for safety. They use it for shelter from predators. They use it for food, weather. And they also use it for accessibility. Um, they can use the network of hedges like a motorway. So we cover a lot of environmental friendly things that we didn't even know existed when this farm started off, you know? There's a lot of ignorance now about not only how we produce milk, but also the different varieties of milk. You know, we, we're geared up to produce the right sort of milk, uh, as I say, for high protein, which is only 3.3% of the whole mm. milk. So it's a tiny amount in percentage terms, but that's what the dairy requires from us. And that's what we've geared our farm up for. But there's a lot of milk produced in this country for the liquid market that have, don't give a, a monkeys what the quality's like, as long as there's plenty of it. So then you're looking at Holstein herds that need high ration, they need a lot of food, they need extra food than just grass, they need, um, you know, probably milk three times a day, or the robots, they can be milked up to four or five times a day with robots. So they're producing a lot of milk in a short space of time because their longevity, you were talking earlier about our cows, we're aiming for our cows to have eight or nine calves each in their lifetime. But when you're talking about Holsteins that are producing this quantity of milk, maybe 10,000, 12,000 litres per year per cow, then their longevity is shortened and they probably only produce about four or five calves because they're knackered. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're worn out. Yeah. But it's all to do with their hybrids because a Holstein is quite a hybrid version of a Frisian. Yeah. The Frisian is more like the Ayrshire, short, uh, chubby, uh, produces a lot of milk off grass. And that's what we're aiming for. We'll just go over the hill so you can see the rest of our farm and then we'll come back down the track back to the farm so you won't be, I won't stand talking in the wind in the cold too long, hopefully. So come on, open your legs, step along, come on girls, you can do this. When I bring the kids up here, we poo prod as well. We turf over the poos and we look at all the worms and all the, the you know, what's Insects. happening to the, yeah, from the children. Worms take the muck into the soil as well. It degrades with the weather. And you can see all this clover, and two kids found four leaf clovers in this field. Oh, so cows love clover. That's really, that's, oh gosh, that's steak that is. You know, we love, we love, you know, um, medium rare steak or something, don't we, with a few new potatoes. That is what they love. But eating that alone will bloat them. They'll fill up with gas and die. So they can't eat that alone, but it's in the sward. So this field doesn't get any artificial fertiliser, it only gets manure, um, presumably, and for years and years and years, so we're, we know it's lacking in nitrogen. So I think spreading it with a bit of artificial will get rid of the buttercups. But at the moment, this year we didn't need to because the grass growth is, the weather has been absolutely perfect. The hot, humid nights after that dry spell. You stand here, there's tons of life going on in this farm because it hasn't changed. We've got these established hedgerows, we, you know, we've not taken anything out, we've not had to put anything back because we've not had to take anything out. Our forefathers, you know, grazed it. It's, it's a grazing farm and we can't afford to cover it all in fertiliser, no. let alone want to do it. And when we spray, like the clumps of, of thistles, we use a knapsack on the quad bite. So you're not spraying the whole field for thistles, you're just doing the bits where you need yeah. to, to control them. We need a healthy wildlife to control B t TB and at the moment we can control TB in the domestic animals, the animals that we can handle like, and keep records from, like all our cows, ear tagged, passported, every animal on the farm has to have a passport. I, that calf that was born yesterday, I shall put his details on the computer and next week a passport will arrive, you know? We can do that, but nobody's doing it for the wildlife. Nobody's controlling the wildlife and we need a healthy wildlife in the, and TB is spread through wildlife and we need everything to contribute to controlling it. So uh, the government's announced a 25 year plan or 20 year plan to deal with TB. And it's costing the taxpayer at the moment 100 million pounds a year to test all the cattle and pay for the vets and all the laboratory stuff and the little bit of compensation the farmer gets for losing a cow. The compensation 
by all means, I don't know, it's about two or three hundred pounds an animal. But when you look at our stock, we've been buying them in for the last five years and the average price we've paid is 1500 And that doesn't include the milk you're going to lose. If you lose an animal to TB, you're losing the milk production and the cost of that. And the compensation doesn't cover that. So it only covers the animal. But our animals are worth eighteen to two thousand pounds a piece. So you know, it's it's you don't want TB. We don't. Nobody wants it. But we've got to control it because Europe hasn't got it. Scotland hasn't got it. It's just in the southwest, and we're the next zone. If it spreads, if it keeps going eastwards, then we're the next area. Um, I spoke to a neighbour farmer, and he said they've been shut down with TB. And he's just over the hill. He's in uh, Great Dolby, which is as the crow flies, probably about three miles just cannot get rid of it they had a reactor they're not got TB they had a reactor to the test so they had an inconclusive and he said he's had inconclusives before and they've they've killed them like post-mortem them or whatever tested them again and they hadn't got it so he keeps getting these inconclusives to the test and the problem with vaccinating cattle which is way off way way off there's no vaccine they're trying to sort it out, but it's years away. It's not on the doorstep. Once you've vaccined an animal, a cow, when you TB test, she will be shown to have TB, but she's got the vaccine in her, not, you know. That's the problem. When they TB test, they can't decide what's diseased and what's got the, the vaccine. It's the same, it, the same result in the testing. So that's the big problem there. And the other big problem is vaccinating badgers is very expensive. How do you administer it? And, how, and it has to be done annually to a badger that's got no you can't control it you can't catch it you can't ear tag it like you can a cow it's got no passport so when you sell the cow it moves on to the next farm and you've got the history on the passport you know the badgers can go between here and there and if he's got some beef animals running amongst them sheep so if he's bought them from a dodgy place other than a market or you know straight from a farm and they haven't been tb tested a badger can go from here across there eat some poo or something because Badgers tip up the poos looking for the worms and the grubs under the pot and then come back in here. And when a badger is foraging at night, they've got no bladder crawl and they pee and poo all over the farm. And then the cows come out and accidentally eat it amongst the grass. That's what we're thinking is how it's spread. So we need a healthy badger population as well as a healthy cattle population. And that's what all these measures have got to do. And it's going to take 20 years, the talking. We've never been a TB free status in the UK. Right. My husband says about 10 or 12 years ago, there was a small area in sort of Somerset, sort of Somerset area that had TB. And if the government at the time had just eradicated it and controlled that better, then we could have been a TB free status by now. It's just yeah. spread from there. Here we're in a very low you know, area, very low. We, we've got a, a fantastic beef market that we sell abroad, okay? And when we sell live beef breeding animals abroad which there's a marvellous market for because everyone rates British beef don't they so when they sell Scottish or Welsh beef animals to breed abroad they're TB tested at the docks and if it was vaccinated they can't tell if it was vaccination or the disease and they'll say no to it so that's that's another reason it's a struggle to do the vaccinations uh, of cattle we have to also point out there's more than one strain of TB. The cattle TB is called bovine TB. Mm. There's lots of different strains of TB. Yeah. Yeah. But the reason that we started pasteurising milk in the 1920s was to stop the transfer of TB through cow's milk. We had inconclusives and the vet said, oh, you better buy some milk because we always drink our own milk many years ago. And I couldn't be bothered to go to the shop. It's just so easy, isn't it, just to get the milk there. <laughs> so we carried on. But, you know, we're used to drinking our milk, you know. But my mother-in-law, you'll see in a bit, maybe she'll come out of the house. She just had a new knee, and she's 85, and it's the first time she's needed anything. And she's fallen over and done stuff, as you do, like I can do tomorrow, is fall over on the farm, and she's never broken a bone. And you think to yourself, she's drunk this milk all her life. Mm -hmm. And Noel's the same. He's 82, and he's up and down off tractors, mm -hmm. running up, shouting and yelling. You know, he's fitting well, and he's drunk. He likes double cream on his cornflakes and things like that. But he's an active man. I think, I think there's anything wrong with whole milk. No. And I don't understand why everyone buys this semi-skimmed stuff. No. Because semi-skimmed, there's no such breed of cow. <laughs> if you want to get, make your way to that water trough, keep going. Oh, we're going on the track and then we're going back on the farm. To... So can you see that uh, telegraph pole in the bottom of the... Uh -huh. That's how steep oh, this thing is. In the distance you can see all the corn. Which is sad because years ago this would have all been grass. Uh, yeah. 
So the arable world is, is, a, is around us, and we will go to neighbouring farmers to fetch our straw, which we use for bedding. So we, we're self-sufficient on grass, um, but when it comes to straw, uh, and we have to buy in food in the milking parlour as well, so we have to buy in that. I saw um, a report on East Midlands today, yesterday, that somebody's oilseed rape was well down in yield because of the cold spring. And the the oilseed rape was in flower well into July, when normally it flowers in April and May, and it was still in flower in July, some of the winter crops. So I think we'll hear a lot more squealing in the news about how bad last year was for arable farmers at this harvest, because there's a lot of land that was left fallow that uh, hadn't been planted. And as you drive around, and there's some fields of brown fields over there, well, they weren't cropped. They've been ploughed now, ready for this next autumn, Mm -hmm. because there's no harvest to get off them. So they've earned no money for 12 months. So I think we'll hear the arable farmers starting squirming about lack of money and cash flow and all the rest of it. Whereas as dairy farmers were complaining about it last year, we had too much grass, the cows are walking through it, they won't eat dirty grass. Um, And obviously, you know, it's hard work in the mud, just getting through the gateways was awful. Washing them down, milking took forever. Water troughs, there's one of the water troughs, and um, they hold, I don't know how many, I don't know, 500 litres, I don't know what it is, but they hold a lot of water. Cows need a lot of water every day, and they like to be fairly close to water troughs. And I admit it, this farm hasn't got enough water troughs. That's one of my next plans, is to invest in more water troughs and water pipes now that the water's free. Well, this is um, a mum to be. This one she hasn't carved yet. The bulls behind one of the bulls. This is Windfall. He came on the farm in uh, May. He's from Derbyshire. He was bred in Derbyshire, and he's very keen actually. And what we do is <laughs> they're both very keen. And what we've been doing is we're putting a bull in with the milking herd every three weeks because she now said the cycles every three weeks because bulls can favour just one cow uh, if she's on heat. But if there's more than one cow on heat, you might not see to the others he might just see to one so you know obviously we need everything back in calf because according to my husband everything on the farm needs to be pregnant except the wife the dog and the daughter <laughs> <laughs> so what we've been doing with it's the t- in law <laughs> yes well past it i'm afraid so this is windfall he's the newer bull and mulberry's in with the herd now so this bull here is having a rest and he's resting with a couple of his mates and once a cow's pregnant, there's no such thing as recreational sex, okay? So he's having a rest. He's, he likes being with mates. And so the far cow in the distance, she's the mother of the calf that's lying down. You can just see the two dots of white. That's the baby calf born last night, and it's obviously had a fill. So they can either lie in a clump of nettles. You can lose them easily in a clump of nettles, or um, nearer the hedge where those thistles and nettles are, or in the bottom of a hedge if the, if the fencing is quite high to stop cows, but a calf could easily walk underneath. They often go in the hedge bottom and hide. And we've lost them that way. So tonight we will get these, this mother and, and calf in, and the cow will go through the milking parlour, give some milk, and then after milking might go in with the calf for the night just to finish off. And then tomorrow the calf will come in my pens and I shall start feeding it manually. It's a Hereford bull calf. It's got a white face, so um, we know that's a beef animal. So eventually in four to six weeks' time, it'll go to market. So I won't keep this one. So it's not one of my 41. I've got 41 heifer calves on the farm at the moment, which is just tremendous. I wanted 35, so I'm I'm beyond expectations of this year's calving. So this bull is called Windfall. His offspring will be born next March and April and May and June. Anyway, next summer. So, yeah, hopefully he's got lots of cows in calf. So the next job to do is to get the vet in and select a load of cows that hopefully have been in calf for three months. And the vet puts his hand inside with an ultrasound machine to check if the cow has got a fetus or not. So um, we need a vet to do that, and that's called pregnancy diagnosis. And then he can say, yeah, this is in calf, this one's barren, this one's in calf, and we go through the herd like that. It's as important to be back in calf as it is to the milk begin. So at the end of their 10-month lactation, they're giving, they have given a lot of milk, and the milk yield drops over a period of 10 months. In the same period, they're also growing the next calf. Yeah. So at the end of their lactation, they get two months off. So these two cows were brought back from across the road, because not only have we got young stock across the road in that new land, we've also got 
10 or 15 dry cows and they're at the end of their they're finished producing milk from the last calf and they're at the end of their trimester of pregnancy right. so when they get to the, within a couple of weeks of calving we bring them into this paddock because it's nearer the buildings it's right in front of our house we can see them at night yeah. wake up in the morning look out the window we can see a calf's been born and it's like my maternity ward really and uh, Mark will see signs like she'll start producing milk you know, milk will start uh, filling her bag. So uh, one guy said, oh, the bones have dropped. I'm not sure, too sure what he meant by that. You know, there's phrases. People have dialogues and phrases, and I'd like to just investigate, ask him again what he meant. He said, oh, that other cow that did calve yesterday, uh, last night, he said, oh, her bones have dropped, so I, I need to find out what he meant by that. And, and also we know by dates, because we watch the bull... With, when the bull's running with the cows and he tries to mate a cow, then we make a note of the ear tag, uh, the collar number of right. the cow. We write that in the diary. Yeah. And then three weeks later, if we see the other bull serving the same cow, then obviously she didn't hold. We've just walked down the track where the cows come into the milk. And then they stand where all that poo is and, and go into the milking parlour. But this is the winter housing. This is where the milkers live in the winter months when they come in so there's 96 cubicles in here and this is where the, we bed them with straw every day and the cows walk into a cubicle and can stand or lie down here and where you stand is where they do the poo and the pee and then we use a tractor to scrape this out during milking times twice a day and then it goes into a clampy bit there where we load it into the muck spreader spread it on the land so a lot more physical work every day uh, in here the gates are usually open, the, there's a little gate, one open there, and the other one's shut at the moment, but that's usually open, and these top gates are open, so the cows can circulate and walk around. There's a big water trough for that silver thing in the corner, that's a huge water trough, again, on the borehole water, so that never freezes in the winter, because you get 100 cows in here, snow hardly sits on this roof, because it's quite a low roof, it's a lot of body heat, and that trough never freezes, which is very good. And then, so the cows eat, sleep, choose a cud and relax in here and then they wander through this gate into the dining room. So this is the bedroom, this is the dining room. Now we talked about silage, you know the big clamp outside. When we feed it we're going to get a trailer, fill it full of silage and then drive it down and it chucks it out through, well I think we might have to lift these, these do come up, but it'll chuck the silage into this trough. And again, it's got open ends at each end so the cows can circulate. But they put their heads through this, this uh, fencing and eat the silage, the fresh silage, and that's ad lib. So they can wander about between there and here throughout the day and night. He leaves a light on for them. <laughs> so the bedroom, that cubicle shed, that's the original farm building that was built in the 60s, late 60s. And where the blue walls were, are, that's where the old milking parlour used to be up until eight years ago. And that used to be in a breast milking parlour for eight cows at a time. And the whole farm then was designed for 60 cows. As I say, I've been married for 20 years now, and all we've done is spend money, built this shed soon after we got married, put the feed fence in, um, and then only eight years ago we built the next one, which is the milking parlour. And also the, where the calves we first saw when we came down to the yard, that's a fairly new shed as well. So that's a new addition. And now this year we've £20,000 on the new silage clamp. Um, and this is on top of buying cows for the last five years, and we've probably spent £100,000 in five years just on buying the Ayrshire breed and the Ayrshire animals. So now we've stopped buying Ayrshire cows and Ayrshire heifers. We're going to breed our own, and there's still a cost. It's still going to cost us possibly £1,000 over two years per animal to rear, but then at the end of the day, it will save us buying in at £1,800 for the same animal. So we're hoping... You know, and not all of them will be fertile, not all of them will make it to milk. So out of the 41 I've got at the moment, my aim is to get 35 into milk in two years' time. Because natural wastage, barren heifers, you know, break a leg, things happen. So you do lose them. So the entrance to the milking parlour is through that door there. You can see the blue walls. So this is the heart of the farm, the milking parlour we built eight years ago. And of course this was a big investment. This, um, the dairy you've walked through, the plant, the building costs and everything you see is cost £100,000. So if you relate that to the cost of a modern day combine, uh, which is probably getting on for £200,000 these days, but a combine has only worked five or six or seven weeks a year. Whereas a milking parlour is working every day, twice a day. So, you know... 
in comparative terms of machinery. This is a it is machinery investment, but it's not got any wheels attached, you know? This is static. So we built the pit long enough to add another two units as and when we've got any money to do it, um, which is why the pit's quite long. But Mark milks six cows aside. It's called a 12-12 full wood herringbone milking parlour. The cows come in, they're fed a ration in the troughs individually from, from an auger that Mark presses the buttons to how many kilos falls into their trough. Um, while they're eating, we clean the udder and then we put the unit on. And the unit is this, which is four cups because the, te- the udder's got four teats. Uh, the udder's made up of four quarters, okay? They're individual. They're independent of each other. So we put the uh, unit between the cow's legs and the, the milking machine is powered by electricity to create a vacuum. And inside this metal cup, there's a rubber liner. And when you put your finger in, you can feel the rubber liner squeeze, release, squeeze, release. And that makes the sound umch, 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 which is a rhythmic sound. And that action is the same as a baby calf drinking directly from its mother. And her body knows that and releases the milk. Whereas a calf would only drink one quarter at a time, this milk machine will, will uh, milk all four quarters at the same time. And the milk goes through this filter here and up over our heads and into the tank where we just walk past. So the milk is direct into there. Milk comes out at body temperature, so it has to be cooled, and the tank is where it's cooled on this farm. So he gets six in, feeds them, puts the units on, and then he'll open that gate, get those six in, feeds them, puts the units on, and then the, this rope takes the units off the cow when she's stopped giving milk. Uh, when she's run dry, and when all six are off, he teeth dips them with iodine, opens that front gate, we turn left and go through that outside door there, up the path and back up the field. And so they go out six at a time, back up to their winter field, to their nighttime field. So we have daytime field and nighttime fields. So the daytime fields are farther away from the farm, but they only have a shorter space of time to eat the grass, whereas in the nighttime they have a longer interval between the milking starting at about four o'clock at the moment and finishing about six, and then in the morning, you know, it's half five, quarter to six when he starts, and finishes about half eight. So there's a longer interval, so they give more milk in the morning's milk than they do in the afternoons.